I really appreciate the opportunity to speak. And as you heard already, Mahara and I go back a number of years. So it's really an honor and a pleasure to be associated uh, with him in this conference and to hear his comments and uh, hear his ideas. I've uh, followed his work over the last 50, 60 years, and it's always excellent work. Today, I know that the session is devoted to notion of social policy designed to improve uh, social uh, inclusion and to promote uh, the structure of, uh, of uh, diversity and uh, human development and human opportunity. And this is a topic I've been working on for many years now in, in, at the Center for the Economics of Human Development and even before. This is part of the economics department of the University of Chicago, but it's a subset that carries on a tradition that's very old at the University of Chicago, the tradition on the economics of human capital. So today I want to talk about one strategy for human development and society development, societal development. And that is promoting skills to promote successful lives. And so I've been working on this topic for a long time, and I just want to summarize some lessons. And I, I continue to work on this. And today I will talk about some work that I'm currently doing in China and also in Ireland that is very much in the spirit. But if you think about the issues of approaching poverty and social immobility, the strategy, the strategy that's frequently developed and applied throughout the world is the notion of alms to the poor. The current Pope, for example, has really stressed this as a central theme of his papacy, but he's hardly alone. And that is the idea of using the tax and transfer system to redistribute income to the poor. And this is the policy that's used a lot in the Western welfare states in Western Europe in particular. In the United States, going back to the 1960s, the U.S. Great Society programs tried this policy as well. And it's part of a, it was part of a broader strategy to end poverty and to promote uh, intergenerational social mobility. And the goal was to essentially end poverty in what appears to be an obvious way, which is to transfer resources, in particular cash and cash programs, food and resources directly to the poor. It also had a shotgun skills approach. By that, I mean, it had a notion of trying to help everybody. And I mean everybody, from the very poor, old people, from the very young, poor people who are trying to develop and emerge into the society at large. And the policy that emerged at that time, this is some 60 years ago or so, was to invest in all stages of the life cycle. So the war on poverty, ended up somewhat with unpleasant circumstances that then had to be remedied in later policy years in the 1990s and early 2000s in the United States. And I'm going to draw primarily on European and uh, United States uh, uh, history, although I will talk about some work I'm doing in China as well. So what happened was in, in a trying to end poverty, it ended up subsidizing this war on poverty subsidizing poverty enclaves. And its, its strategy was to detach the poor from society, to isolate them in some sense. And if we look, for example, at what the success of this was, the recent work done by Hartley and Ziliak at the University of Kentucky talks about whether or not the war on poverty had a real effect of reducing the intergenerational correlation of welfare participation. And what actually happened, as you can see from this graph, going back to 1974, when the data first started being collected, is that if anything, the, the correlation in which we look at the dependence of a person raised in poverty and, and their children, a person in poverty and their children, how much correlation there was, if anything, the dependence increased over time and it didn't decrease as was initially hoped. And, and this is a major, uh, this, this graph has actually been recently updated. I didn't get a chance to update it, but it's a very persistent and negative story in some sense, that instead of ending poverty and promoting social mobility, we seem to be keeping alive the link between those raised in poverty and uh, 
their, their family circumstances when young and their own circumstances as adults. So many of the policies that were approved initially had very strongly regressive components. And this turned out to be because people didn't understand the full disincentive effects of poverty programs. There were very heavy implicit taxes on the working poor. There were penalties for marriage. There were, there were many subsidies that were unintended, I think, initially, that discouraged people from working, and it actually promoted uh, single family homes, which then created poverty for the parents, for the single parent leaving, leading the home. So what do we do? What happened after the war on poverty? Well, the United States and other countries learned from this. And there've been a number of similar reforms in Denmark, where I'm working, doing a lot of active work, but in Britain and in other countries around uh, Western Europe. And so what it did was that people began, and American social policy has shifted from eliminating taxes on the earnings of the poor. So that originally there was a disincentive to work. So that if somebody earned above a certain threshold, they were taxed at rates that were close to 100%. That's been eliminated. And there's a much stronger incentive now to, uh, to promote work. Robert Moffat at Johns Hopkins University and Bruce Meyer here at the University of Chicago have really documented how this policy has changed. And there's been some stake scaling back in the sense of disincentives to the working poor in some of the recent policy changes. But generally, America now has a progressive tax and transfer policy, which means that it's trying to encourage people to work and it does subsidize the, uh, the poor in a way that it wasn't doing 40 or 50 years ago. And it subsidizes the working poor to work, to participate in other words, in the larger society. But there's still an unfocused skills policy that characterizes the country. Now, an effective way to alleviate poverty and to enhance social mobility is to build skills. So instead of, you know, there's a famous saying, I, mean, I don't know what the, the, the status of this is in the, in the Philippines, but I think it's worldwide, that you can give a man a fish and you'll satisfy his needs for the day. You can teach a man to fish and he will be succeeded, he will succeed the rest of his life. That's a versions of that wisdom around the world. And literally, the strategies that have been pursued, I think, successfully build skills, and they recognize the importance of skills in the economy. And we know that as modern economies emerge, as new technologies appear, skill policy is really extraordinarily uh, important, and building skills very, very important. So if we see some of the newest work on skill bias, technical change, and on the way of automation, and technology are changing the workplace all around the world, we know that more skilled people are the ones better able, not only to benefit from those technologies, but to adapt to change. A recurrent theme of this land of work is to understand how people can react to the very substantial changes in trade, technology, and world uh, patterns of, uh, of, of commerce. But to create a focused skill enhancement policy, we need to draw on some knowledge, recent knowledge about the dynamics of life cycle skill formation. We know that skills are major determinants of flourishing lives. And if we wanna promote inclusion and social mobility, we need to foster skills. It's, a, it's an effective policy. And when it's been tried and successfully implemented, it's had a beneficial effect on all involved the society at large, the individuals who gain the skills, and the larger society around them in various ways. And it builds successful lives. A skilled workforce is also flexible and adaptable. And this is very important because as technology changes, and as we get into new trading patterns in the world, it becomes increasingly important to be able to adapt to that change. There's also a sense in which we can think about building skills is creating an autonomous individual, a person who has dignity, agency, and engagement in society. This doesn't mean a necessarily selfish person, but it means a person able to stand on their own two feet and able to help others around them, and therefore to, to expand the whole level of society. 
So I want to argue today that we need to think about this in a somewhat different way. And you'll see developed in many international agencies and many well-meaning organizations, even NGOs and other groups around the world. So how should we address these problems? And this is a very important point. We've come to understand the origin of many social problems. Now, it has already been introduced. There are aspects of macroeconomic policy. There are macro issues about changing the incentives, facing workers and firms uh, to make them more likely to benefit from their individual efforts, whether it's building a company, acquiring a skill and the like. But I think we also need to think about how we can make people stronger, more robust, more able to benefit from the modern world. And I think that what we need to understand is if you look at current policy discussions, and this is certainly true in my country, I don't know the Philippines so well, but I would imagine it's true there, that they focus on one problem at a time and they decide to address that one problem. So it's like we have a problem and we solve it. So for example, for fragmented solutions, we have things like uh, for employment, we increase jobs, we have tax breaks. For crime, we increase the police force and crack down on criminals. For health, we have better medical facilities. For teenage pregnancy, we conduct pregnancy prevention programs. And then as I already mentioned, to reduce inequality, prevent, give cash transfers and promote housing. To promote skills, focus on schooling and schooling quality especially college going. So when people think about skills, they almost immediately think about schools. Now, I'm not saying any of these ideas are wrong, but what I suggest is that undergirding these problems and providing a base for tackling all these problems, I think there's a better and more effective way. Fragmented solutions are often not the most effective ones. The problems, these problems and their causes are often highly interrelated. And so I'm asking you today to rethink public policy. Now, there's a statement again. I don't know the, the version of this in the Philippines and Tagalog, but I do know that there's a statement that says that only the squeaky wheel gets the grease. You understand what I mean? When a problem arises, we tackle it. So the question really becomes, should we wait for problems to appear and then tackle it? There's some merit in that. If we're solving all kinds of problems that aren't there, why waste resources doing it? I think it really depends. Persons who are in trouble, the persons causing problems like crime and ill health and so forth, are often very well identified and even well identified early on. And so for this class of problems, and I'll show you how broad it is, targeting early life risks seems to be an important way to at least avoid those problems or to ameliorate them. So here's an example from the, this is all New Zealand data. And they follow these people into their mid-40s. So they look at a group of about 22% of the people. I'll tell you what they are like. They're generally disadvantaged people who can be easily screened in their early childhood years. And in New Zealand, they account for like 66% of all social welfare cases, 77% of fatherless children, 54% uh, of smoking, 40% uh, of obesity, and... Uh, 81% of the crime. That's, that's the rough approximation to the Pareto principle. And what it seems then is that we can more effectively than we used to think target 
who, which populations are at risk and which ones we can benefit. And on the other hand, there's about 30% that seem to be very much more advantaged. And they never participate in these groups, at least through the mid 40s. Not any of the crime, very little social welfare, very little in terms of smoking, obesity, and the like. So that this populations become segmented and predictable in a way that social policy can draw on them and actually help uh, tackle social problems. So what do we know? So if we look at individuals in the relatively early ages, three, five, seven, we can look at measures of IQ, self-control, socioeconomic status, and maltreatment in the family. And those turn out to be the factors that produce that low risk 30% that I mentioned before. And those people short in self-control, those people living in, in very poor socioeconomic environments and with child maltreatment, those are the ones who are actually at risk. So what I think is what we should do is move beyond the notion of skill enhancement and social policy to move beyond school. And even if we wanna bolster school, we have to recognize that schools are most effective if children come into those schools and their parents highly motivated, and really able to learn and take advantage of what the school is offering. So I think the focus on schools misses something very fundamental. And that's the early years of a child's life, especially the role of a family in creating these gaps. Schools are important, but schools alone can't close the gaps. We need to understand skills that are life relevant. So what we've really come to understand, it used to be this notion of PISA, I mean, many countries are still hung up on PISA. It may surprise many people that in fact, even PISA and the PISA tests now have been broadened to include items more than just standard achievement tests, more than just PISA tests as typically, you know, for example, in Shanghai, they're very happy that they lead the world in terms of PISA scores. But yet PISA itself has come to understand that we need to have a broader array of skills cognitive, social, and emotional skills to enhance the capacities of persons. And I think that is what the modern understanding shows. And I'll show you what we've come to understand, and I've, I've played a role in this and many others as well. Economists working together with social scientists, for example, sociologists, as well as with uh, psychologists and people in schools of education have come to understand the cognitive ability measured by IQ, it's important. But there are a number of other skills, motivation, the ability to show up on time, sociability, self-regulation, self-esteem, the ability to defer gratification. All of these are very, very important. And we've come to recognize them. And in fact, new PISA tests are being given that exactly are designed to measure these social and emotional skills to better guide educational policy going forward. And one thing that surprises many people, at least with US data, if you look at lifetime earnings, the present value of discounted earnings, what we find is that IQ alone explains at most four to 5% of the variability in lifetime earnings. And what we've come to understand is that if we take this vector of skill, cognitive and social and emotional skills, they can help us reduce they help lead to reduce crime, they help promote higher earnings, they promote better health, greater civic participation, less teenage pregnancy, they promote social trust, greater trust in human agency. So it builds the skills and the dignity of the larger population. It gives people the capacity to control their own lives and help the lives of those in their families and those they value. And I think these skills, as a vector of the principal outputs. And so I think we should move beyond just thinking about scores on PISA tests and scores on achievement tests, even though there's a huge emphasis in many, many literatures, many education. So the question is, how are these skills produced? Schools are major producers, but I'm never gonna say that schools are unimportant. They're very important. Education is probably one of the single most important factors after the family. But the family plays in a major role that frequently gets neglected. 
skill formation starts very early. It starts in the womb. As we've understood the physiology and the uh, uh, developmental psychology of child development, we know that early life conditions affect uh, child, child skill development long before children enter formal schooling. So here's something taken from American data. But this has been replicated in China, rural China now. It's been replicated in the country of Colombia in South America. It's been replicated in Brazil and, of course, in Western Europe, in Ireland and Britain and other places. And this graph is very, very important. It's very important. And this is just achievements for us now. It's what I said not to focus on solely, but it's something that is so salient that at least we can start here. So if you look at the gaps in achievement scores at age 18, and you look at the gaps by the mother's education, which is another measure of family status, what you see is substantial gaps. These are scores on achievement tests. So these are standardized scores, where you take a score, divide by the standard deviation, and come up with a, what some people call a Z-score. And you can see real gaps at age 18. But if you follow these curves back to age three, which is the first time we can reliably measure these kinds of things, that we see most of those gaps are there. They're certainly there by age five, and they're actually there even at age three. So these gaps start much earlier. And one thing that's interesting is that in this particular measure of achievement, I don't want to go to the wall saying this is the right measure, the real controversy about what the proper measure is, and I've written a lot on that, but I'm not going to talk about that today. What we see is that more or less the schools, unequal as they are, these are all American data, are not exactly enlarging or shrinking this business between the most advantaged, the most educated mothers and the least educated mothers. And this I think is very important. So what we've come is to understand that the wisdom of investing more in prevention and less in remediation, at least in the case of creating skills, and those skills themselves will translate into reduced crime, greater health, more earnings, higher employment, and to create, in other words, a society that's more civically motivated with greater trust, and it creates a civic uh, a benefit for the opportunity. So what I think we need to understand, co-equal, co and maybe I would say with greater priority, is the role of the families and social environments. So not leaving things just to the school, not saying, oh, we're gonna produce skills by investing only in school. We should understand that it's parents working with children that make schools effective or not effective. And the family is the cornerstone of skill development. So what have we learned about that? We've learned that encouraging and supporting families is very key to creating successful lives. It's cost-effective and fair, and I'll show you some evidence. Now, in the United States anyway, I don't know the story in the Philippines. I wish I did. I, I didn't really find so much statistics that I could access on the Philippines on these matters. But Philippine demographers and economists can surely uh, fill this in. But what we see is that in the U.S., there's a growing group of people who are never married, single-parent households. There are plenty of divorced families, Widow, widowing is going down as mortality improves. Separations has been more or less stable over time. But the biggest growth are families that are never married and where the family, the husband and wife are not together. And in fact, they're usually a single parent, which in the United States anyway, can create and does create serious problems for the mother who heads that family. And we know these home environments matter. This has been replicated in many countries around the world. I'm just showing you the first instance of this study, showing the difference in the environment that young children experience between people at the bottom of the social barrel, what we call welfare in the first bracket, first table here in this uh, figure, working class, a middle class, and then professions. You look at the children are hearing so many more words in professional families. And the style of the in parenting is totally different. It's instead of prohibitions, as frequently happens in very disadvantaged environments, it's much more associated with affirmatives 
and many fewer prohibitions. So in that sense, there's a structure. And this leads, and this just is now still just looking at the structure and saying that kids at age three, at the beginning of my previous graph, those kids are speaking twice as many words, more than twice as many words as children from the welfare family, the children from the professional family. And in the United States anyway, there's been a real trend that more advantage, that this knowledge is getting around. And what we see is huge gaps in expenditures on children versus at the top versus the bottom of the household. And that is a major form of inequality that affects children before they even enter school. So harm environments are associated with child outcomes. Now, if you look at those gaps that I showed before, Many people, many conservatives in particular, would argue, oh, that's just genetic. Smart people have smart kids, and they, smart people get highly educated. So all you've told me is there's heritability. And some people would even take that as a case for eugenics, where we might want to essentially modify the, uh, you know, control, suppress the, the people who are disadvantaged or poor. I want to argue that the evidence really is not that strong on purely genetic determination or even major form of genetic determination. What we've really come to understand, and I'll show you some evidence, is that targeted early childhood programs can reduce achievement gaps and produce better child outcomes, suggesting that this is some genetic phenomenon, some biological phenomenon that's fixed, but it is a phenomenon that can actually be directly addressed through active social programs that target the disadvantaged. So what I think we've come to learn though, it's more than just working with children. It's also understanding, working with parents. We understand the parents are there. And the parents here, I mean broadly, the caregiver in case the mother's away or maybe even dead. In rural China, I'm working with a group of families where the parents have actually migrated from the West to the East to get ma ma manufacturing jobs. And so the, what's left behind is the grandmother. So whoever the caretaker is, they play a major role in shaping the skills of the child. But what we've come to understand, and child development experts have understood this, but economists have been slow to come to the realization that it's a parent-child interactions or a crucial form of investment. So let me give you some idea about why I don't think genetics is much of the story and give you an idea of what can be done. I'm gonna first of all, talk about two very well-known programs in the United States. One is the Perry Preschool Program. The Perry Preschool Program targeted children ages three to four in a suburb of Detroit uh, called Ypsilanti, Michigan, just west of Detroit. And uh, it was primarily African-American children, very poor, and it was two hours a day for this during the course of the school year. There was another program called Abecedarian, which was done in North Carolina. And that was more intensive. It started earlier and it went a little later. It's eight hours per day. So it's a more intensive program. But effectively, much of the teaching and learning component is the same. Now, Perry Preschool and many of these programs have a component to them. I'll show you one crucial component, but let me, so I want to give you uh, some idea of what, how these programs have actually operated. So here's an example. Here's an example of how IQ as measured in the early age went up. The Perry program was evaluated by a randomized controlled trial. I don't know how much JPAL has taken over the discussion in, uh, in the Philippines, but I do know that randomized trials are really a feature of much modern social policy evaluation. And I'll give you results on randomized trial. So these children who are starting at age three were basically all subnormal IQ, they're age 80 or so. And one thing that happens, we followed these kids. These kids were start, this program started in the early 60s. We've now followed these children until they're in the mid fifties. So I'll give you some idea of what's going on. So what happened was in the early years of the program, the children got higher IQs and the parents and the control group children did not. And so early people were saying, oh, this is a great miracle, we boosted IQ. 
But then at age 10, the treatment and control groups caught up. And this led to a whole discussion. It led to a discussion saying that we can't do anything about Arthur Jensen wrote these papers that were suggesting that we couldn't do anything about disadvantaged children. No matter how hard we tried, the genes kicked in, and there we were, they couldn't do a damn thing. And that's what got the whole Jensen controversy going. And it translates today into, well, 20 years ago, into a book by Charles Murray called The Bell Curve. And this book became very powerful in its influence in some circles, emphasizing genetic determination. But these studies, and her, certainly Hernstein and Murray, assumed that IQ was an important determinant of life outcome. I already told you that IQ explains only about 4 to 5% of the variability in lifetime income. But Perry was not a failure. When we follow these children over the lifetime, we find that kids did better in school, had higher levels of employment, lived healthier and more socially productive lives. And so we look at an annual rate of return, following these people now into their mid fifties, we get rates of return of seven to 10% per annum. Per annum, that's a huge return. This is a real return too. And it's after taxes, so it accounts for all the welfare loss that the good public finance economists worry about. And how did it work? It worked primarily through boosting social and emotional skills. It even led to higher achievement test scores, PISA scores. Why? Because kids were more motivated. Even if they had the same IQ, they were actually more highly motivated in school. So achievement tests, which is what Murray and Ernstein actually used, don't measure just pure IQ. They measure effort and the desire to learn. So this lasts over generations. We followed not only the children in the original study, but their children. These people are 55. Most of them have children. We follow their children at least into their mid-20s, uh, early 30s. And if you look at their own children, you see that the children of the original treatment group have children themselves that are more successful in school and much less likely to be arrested. They're more likely to have some employment experience and to graduate so that there are intergenerational effects. So there's a multiplier working through these programs. Now, what do we know about this? What do we know about this? Well, one mechanism that was very important, especially in the American context, is that when children were in this program, when, when, the, when the, the children of, who were in the original program, when they themselves got in their 30s, these people, the blue curve here, the top curve, shows you how much more they were likely to be married and have live in stable families. These are the uh, control, uh, people in the control. So the male participants who were in the program more likely to be in stable marriages. And it's led to successful lives for their own children. The ABC program started even earlier. It improved parenting practices. There was higher educational attainment. But one thing that many people are surprised about is how much these programs actually boosted health. So if you look, for example, we have a paper that we published in Science some eight years ago now. And if you look at the study, you can see that the blood pressure is lower, both diastolic and systolic. The notion of hypertension is lower. The cholesterol is lower. The metabolic syndrome is lower. So what you see is real health benefits. Now, why is that? Hey, wait a minute, that's a program that was early childhood program. How would it operate? Because it promoted the skills that lead to self-control, that promote education, that promote knowledge. And these themselves give the agents to control their own lives in a better, more effective way. And when we look at all the benefits, including the health benefits, what we find is the return on this program is even higher real return of 13.7% per annum, very high return. And it led to, if you look at the components, to high rates of return. I won't go into the details because I don't know if they're highly relevant here in, in the Philippines. But what's one of the main mechanisms underlying these programs? What it does, and what we saw as a side benefit, and this wasn't looked at initially, that these programs enrich the home lives of children 
outside of the child care center. It keeps the parents actively engaged long after the children leave the program. So if we look in the first years between the children, of uh, the parents of the treatment and control group, we can see that the treatment parents, the parents of the treated group, are more likely to be believe in their, their important role in parenting. They're more likely to provide warmth for their children. They're more likely to be actually less authoritarian, to be more loving and caring for their children. And so the essential ingredient, one is, there, so the real question is these programs do lots of different things. And so one of the difficulties in this literature has been focusing on, oh, this program does that, you know, we have a play period, we have home visits, we do this and that. The question is, can we isolate what features are most important? And so what I want to do, and I do in this research, is examine programs that focus attention on only one aspect of child development, but one that turns out to be very well documented. And these are so-called home visiting programs. So I've been working with a group in Jamaica now for a number of years. And Jamaica had its own program, but it's different from these omnibus programs like Perry and ABC. This was a program that was in the Jamaican slums. It was done some 35 years ago now. It targeted stunted children. These programs are about one-tenth to one-twentieth of the cost of the previous program. And what does it do? We follow these kids through age 30 now. And it, it random assignment again, all everything I'm giving you is from random assignment. And so what it did is we found when we follow these children now to age 30, there are long lasting effects on cognitive and social and emotional skills. So if you look, for example, now at age 30, the age 30 results, you can see that the controlled children, the treated children are much more likely to essentially uh, go to college and finish college and, and so forth. And the wages of the treated children are much higher. And we can look at a lot of other dimensions. I won't go into them because I'm running out of time. More recently, I've been taking this program. And the, be the beauty of this program is the following. This program is very robust. In the original Jamaican program, the home visitors were not PhDs. They weren't MAs. They were visitors who were of the same level of education as the mother, often very low level of education in the Jamaican slums. We've taken this to Western China, a province called Gansu, very close to Senchan, very poor area. And what we do is we find a diversion of the Jamaican program, and we look at these kids, and we have home visiting. And the purpose of the program is not to put these kids in an expensive center, not to put them into all these different... But what we do is you strip out one component of the program, and this component is basically sending visitors one hour a week, one hour a week now, but it encourages the caretaker. It's targeting the caretaker to talk to children, to make ploy books and the like. In the original Jamaican program, they encouraged the caregivers to take materials from the village dump, something very cheap, so that they could actually just do this. And it would be teaching the child and the caregiver to interact with the child and to, and to realize, to teach the caregiver, the mother, exactly the benefit of having that interaction. And so it's, in the China Reach program, we have a whole set of protocols. I don't have time to go through this, but if we look at standardized achievement scores, now here I don't have age 30 results. We only have results through age four. So these are early on. But what we find is substantial improvement in language, social and emotional skills, both in midline and in the end line of this program. And we also see huge impacts on improving the quality of home life. And if you look at the skills that emerge from these programs, you see substantial benefits, whether you look at the density on the left side or the CDFs on the right side. And this is true for social and emotional skills, fine motor skills and the like. And I would argue that there's another program like this, which is Preparing for Life. It's a little bit older now. It's also a randomized trial, but it's similar to a home visiting program. And it's similarly cheap. It's one hour a week. Sometimes, in many cases, one hour uh, every two weeks. 
And what you see is basically trained mentors, but at the same level as the mother. So these are not, training the visitors is not a difficult task. And what we can see is you support the child in very low intensity. So the children are getting 51 hours at most over a five-year program, much less intensive and therefore much less expensive. But if you look, for example, at school entry, the treatment children getting very similar idea, the mother learns how to interact with the child, has play materials and so forth, the, the, the treatment children are doing much better in terms of entry level, much better in terms of social and emotional skills, much better able to manage attention, much better able to essentially uh, perfect, you know, perform at verbal ability, uh, much less obesity and so forth. So what is the universal feature of these effective programs? Well, child development experts would have said this some 80 years ago with a Russian uh, mental, Russian developmental psychologist called Vygotsky who talked about this program. And he promoted parenting and he talked about what was called scaffolding. He had an image from some kind of, like a sculptor building a child. You find a child where the child's at and take the child to the next step, but it's gradual. You, you sound out where the child is and you teach the parent how to scaffold. And this promotes parenting, mentoring, and therefore you don't need a lot of time with the child at a center. What you need is a lot of time with the parent working or the mentor or whoever is staying at home is fostering the child and teaching these lessons. So let me just go on to conclude. I guess I'm over time, so I got to stop very shortly. But what we've also come to understand, I don't want to say it all, it's all over at age three or age five or age eight, no such thing. But what we do know is that you build an important skill base earlier and you make later investments so much more productive. If you build, it's like growing a, a tree, it's growing some kind of plant. If you have a very strong root system, a very strong child in terms of motivation and ability, it becomes much easier for the child to learn. And so we know there's a life cycle process there. So we, we know that there's a study here at the University of Chicago, which starts with very disadvantaged children. It mentors those children. So in other words, it's providing this kind of enriched parenting. And if you look at this lottery system, it's, it's mentoring the children. So if you look at age three, four, and five, this is a randomized controlled trial and you're looking at standardized test scores, what you see is huge gains. These are the numbers in bold here by this is work by my colleague, Rowdenbush, Lisa Rosen, and Hasser. And we can see, for example, how uh, the kids are actually uh, doing much better. So adolescence is also a target of opportunity, but adolescent interventions are far more effective. And let me just uh, make one observation about crime. Kerry Moffat, one of these people who mentioned in the Dunedin study earlier, has this very interesting study about the onset of type of criminal trajectory. And this is found to be true around the world. This is more like a biological phenomenon. There's, an early, there's a group that's life persistent aggressive behavior. And this manifests itself starting at age three and four, exactly the age that Perry was targeting, it turns out. And then there's another group where these adolescent aggressive behaviors emerge in the, in the later stage of life, but it's not the same. So early emergence and then adolescence emergence. These are the two types of criminal trajectory. Perry focused on the early year, three to four. And what you see is an age crime curve. This is very well documented that most crime appears among younger people. But what we see is that adolescence crime is much less, much less. And so there are two distinct theories. There's life course persistent criminal behavior, which starts early in aggressive behavior and lasts over the whole lifetime. And then there's this adolescence limited behavior, which has a much shorter trajectory. We can target both, but two different types of behavior that we can target. And what we find is that if when you look at adolescence limited behaviors, that in the Dunedin study, the Dunedin study is just an observational study. It's not an intervention. But what it shows is that, you know, adolescent intervention, people living short lives 
uh, short criminal lies, I mean, say that, not short lies, but uh, life force persistent, many more convictions and especially many more violent convictions. And so we know that targeting these times can be very opportune. So at the core of effective mentoring is basically parenting, attachment, interaction. That sounds like a very soft and fuzzy thing for an economist to talk about, but it's not. And it's actually just what, what good schools are doing, what good individualized instruction is doing. And so what we've come to understand in terms of skill and character development is something from physiology, which is the slowly developing prefrontal cortex, which regulates decision-making and judgment, what psychologists call executive function. That can still be developed even in the late adolescence, early 20 years. But the general pattern that emerges is the following. There's an interplay among these different skills, social and emotional skills, health and cognitive skills. They interact. And the theme, the motto, if you will, is that skills beget skills. And when we look at the dynamics of skill formation, we recognize the importance of starting early. And in terms of economics, the term dynamic complementarity is really important. Investing early creates greater receptivity. So think of it as a dynamic process. You build a skill base, then you make an investment later. But if you start investing in an already strong skill base, they can learn new skills. And so learning we know is this dynamic sequential process. And we formalize that. We characterize that through standard dynamic programming methods. I won't go into that today. But it does mean that part of the high return the early childhood investment is precisely because it benefits returns later down the mainstream. So early on, we can invest in the early years, providing nurture to the child, avoiding fetal alcohol syndrome, avoiding a lot of the conflicts that go out there. We know that we can get very high returns. Why? What I mean is it's not that schooling doesn't have a high return. That's not the way to read this graph. But it's simply saying, that if I put one unit of value, so here I'm using reals, but you know this is uh, some, some measure, some returns to a real value investment. What we find is that programs targeted towards the earliest years have this benefit precisely because they have lasting benefits in building the capital stock, the human capital stock for learning at later ages. And if we only wait until schooling or dead remedial job training, we're getting very low returns because we let the skill base deteriorate. So what we should be careful, I'm not saying that schooling doesn't matter. I'm not saying job training doesn't matter. We get very high returns to schooling, but for those who have high level of ability and motivation created and formed largely in the early years. So let me just conclude. Uh, what we found, of course, is that it returns to college education are high for the most able and motivated students. So if we look at the U.S., we're getting rates of return are 22% for the most capable and motivated students. So let me summarize. This is only part of the story. And I realize in terms of the, the, the introductory remarks already made in this symposium that there are many other factors at work. Skill, the policies towards regulation, policies towards capital investment taxation. I'm not saying this is the only thing that would be relevant. But I think if we recognize the life cycle of skill formation, we recognize we can build the skills, the skills that we need, and we do so more effectively at the early age, that we know that these skills matter. They are really huge by family background. They can be addressed by intervention, so there's no genetic determination here. Families are the main producers of skills, not schools. That's really important. And effective schools are supported by effective families. So I think what will really help will be a comprehensive approach to skill formation. So thank you very much. I think I went over a little bit and I look forward to any comments. And I guess Mahar is gonna talk, I'm not sure. I'd be very interested in hearing him. I haven't seen him for a long time. So thank you for your attention and uh, I look forward to any comments or remarks that you have.